Uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Barry. I'm going to do the best I can to live up to this introduction. So, I, um, I really enjoy uh, coming out and speaking about my business, the profession that uh, I chose. I, I come from a police family. My dad was a police officer. My brother is a sergeant of police uh, up in Lowell still. And uh, my children are gravitating towards that uh, profession, which I, I was kind of hoping somebody would get out of the business at some point in time. It doesn't appear as though it's going to happen. Um, Paul's done a very good job of laying out uh, a framework um, that explains sort of the, the uh, academic and, and uh, the fundamental reasons why being a police officer for the last 30 years in Massachusetts has been a very exciting time. Um, I have been engaged and involved in a uh, significant change in the way we do our business and the way we look at our business. And I've been very lucky uh, to have worked very closely with some of the people that Paul has mentioned. Uh, Paul, uh, Bill Bratton and I uh, have been friends for uh, 20 years. Uh, we go back to his time here in Boston. and. Um, I've had the unique experience of, of uh, visiting him in, in, uh, in New York and, and looking at the work that he did uh, in, in that city. Uh, as Paul said, dramatic, uh, fundamental uh, change in, in the way our business is, is, uh, is operated. Uh, and, uh, and also on in LA as, as he traveled out there and, uh, and did much the same thing in, in the other uh, big city that, that has been such a problem uh, with crime over the decades. Um, so it's, it's, it's been exciting to work closely with him. I've worked closely with Judge Kelly, the, the author of that, uh, of that seminal work, uh, Broken Windows. It, uh, it really has been used by um, change agents in my business to explain to street level offices exactly what we're asking them to do differently. So I realize how important that is. I realize how important it is to move the theory uh, to the street and to make sure that the officers on the street understand that facing problems of disorder and, and making sure that we're prioritizing the small things make a difference in the, in the ultimate serious crime picture in the city. And so we've been doing this for quite some time now, myself and, 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 and dozens of committed colleagues across America in, in, in in most of the large cities have signed on to this, uh, to this new theory of policing. And so Paul has laid it out for you. Uh, he's talked about the, uh, about the past that we got. I came on the police department in 1978. I went to the police academy from September to, to December, and in January of 1979, I stepped out on the street as a brand new police officer. And I had it fairly easy. Um, I had it easy because I wasn't expected to do anything except catalog, catalog the crime that had occurred. The academics, the politicians, the citizens at large were giving us, police, a pass on responsibility for control of crime. Uh, our expectations were that we were to respond to crime quickly, that we were to document the crime that had taken place, and hopefully prosecute the people who were responsible for the crime with the idea that we were sort of firing a shot across the head of the community at large, that if you made the mistake of trying to um, be involved in criminal activity, that there would be ramifications. And therefore, many people would not do that. That was really the theory. Um, on a practical level, as a brand new police officer in 1978, I was asked to step out on the street and wait for radio calls. The radio calls were driven by 911 systems that were just newly being put in place. And uh, people would call the police and say that they had a problem or a crime had just been committed, and we would race quickly to the scene. That whole response system was built up over 40 or 50 years after the advent of two technological improvements that became uh, associated with police. One was the motor vehicle, and the other was uh, the telephone, and eventually uh, the connection between the telephone and the radio systems that were put in cars. 
And so our whole business was built on the fact that if we just got to the scene of the crime quickly enough, we could make an arrest, hold people accountable, and that would stop crime from occurring. And so in 1978, uh, I did that. And I did that very well, if I can say so myself. Um, and I enjoyed that. Putting bad guys in jail was the reason I took this job. And it really is a, um, a very interesting way to do business, uh, simply to you know, race quickly to the scene and try to catch the bad guy in the act. The problem was that after I did this for a little while, I realized that we caught very few bad guys in the act. As a matter of fact, there was a study done uh, by the National Institute of Justice in, in the 1980s uh, that said pretty definitively that people didn't call the police uh, after they had been victimized by a crime for between five and seven minutes after the crime took place. So after you get robbed and hit on the head, while you're sitting on the sidewalk thinking about it, <laughs> it takes a few minutes to realize that, boy, I better call the cops here. And so if the incident happens now, and it takes you five or seven minutes to call us, even if we get there in three minutes, the bad guy is gone. And we're only catching the really stupid ones that hang around. <laughs> <laughs> now, i got to tell you, there's a fair number of them. <laughs> but it wasn't really the best way for us to be looking at a whole business. And, and, and you got to think about this. There were billions of dollars invested in this theory with very little research done about it. It just seemed to be the right thing to do to get there quickly and to catch the bad guys. And, you know, this is America with the sheriffs and the marshals and all the stuff that happened in the West back then. It was a great way to do business. It was a life of adventure. <laughs> and every year at the end of the year, they would publish crime statistics. We saw them. They, they, the crime statistics would be collected until January. And then it took three or four months uh, to collate the information and to get it into the federal government. And then around April or May, we would get a report from the federal government that would tell us how bad our crime was the year before. And so as police officers, we look at that and we'd say, hey, crime went up again. Boy, they're never going to lay us off. That's a pretty good deal. <laughs> and that was it. That was the accountability that we had. Now, now I, I'm making light of this. Obviously, there was very good police work done back then. Very brave people went to very dangerous situations and arrested very bad people and put them in jail. But it wasn't lowering the crime rate. So every year, no matter how many people we locked up, the crime rate got worse. Now, I was trained this way, and for the first 10 or 12 years of my life, I rose up through the ranks uh, from being a walking root officer to being a patrol officer that responded to scenes of crime to being a detective and then a detective sergeant and a detective lieutenant and a detective captain. And during the course of that time, uh, crack cocaine made its appearance in Massachusetts. Um, large uh, Colombian and, and Dominican uh, cocaine distribution rings uh, arranged themselves in, in, in the state. And unfortunately for me in Lowell, Lowell was identified in, in the early 1990s as a source city for heroin and cocaine in New England. You could literally buy cocaine and heroin in Lowell for, for less money than you paid for it in Boston and some of the other bigger cities. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but during the course of that time, I was asked to go and do something about that. So I was put in charge of a combined uh, local, state, and federal task force uh, that uh, did regional drug cases in the Merrimack Valley. And, and we did cases that uh, really stretched up and down from Florida uh, to Massachusetts. Uh, we, we very early on um, took advantage of the new RICO statutes that had been passed. And, uh, and we started to do electronic surveillance along with the federal authorities of cocaine distribution networks. So I have personally sat there in, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a room and listened to drug dealers ordering cocaine from Columbia that was being transshipped through Florida or New York up into Massachusetts. And, uh, and, and we took off a lot of drug deals. We arrested the largest seizure of, of cocaine that, that I was involved in was 28 kilos. A um, lot of dope moving around, a lot of money moving around. We seized millions of dollars in funds. Um, and we really thought we were doing the right thing. When I first took over the drug unit, we were doing five search warrants a year. And when I left the drug unit, we were doing 200 search warrants a year. 
So 200 search warrants in a city the size of Lowell is a lot of search warrants. And it, keeps, it kept us busy. But in many ways, we were just on a treadmill. Um, we, we, we kept arresting larger and larger characters. We kept arresting more and more people. But we realized that the city looked worse and worse every year. For every person we took off the street, there were two people willing to take their, to take their place because the profit margin was so high. And it was in um, 1992, 91, 92, I was called to a meeting in the chief's office. And there were some real estate people there, along with a representative from Senator uh, Kerry's office. And the real estate people had gone to the senator and said, we need to do something about drugs and Lowell, it's out of control. And so the senator came in, the senator's people came in, sat down with us, and I, 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 I started to realize that maybe we were doing, that maybe there was another way to do this, okay? And this had nothing to do with broken windows or any kind of information I got outside the police department because policing is a very parochial uh, occupation or profession, depending on where you're at. And uh, you don't see and hear a lot of things outside of doing things the way you've always done. I sat down at this meeting and the real estate people said, we cannot sell property in the city of Lowell. We cannot rent storefronts because of all the drugs here. And I said, yeah, there are a lot of drugs here. Look at all the arrests we've made. I was throwing statistics out at the people to say, we're doing everything that we can do. And in some ways, trying to blame, putting the blame on, on the courts or on somebody else. It wasn't, it wasn't my fault. I was doing everything I could. But they started to lay out the headlines that we had got in making these arrests. And they said, it looks like, because of these headlines, that every other, every other house in, in the city is a, is a drug den and people are afraid to come in here. And I started to realize that the very headlines that we were garnering in doing what we thought was the right thing were, were, were actually frightening people and scaring people away uh, from a city that needed assistance, that needed new people, that needed to have some economic development to survive. So instead of helping the problem, we were actually hurting the problem. And it was at that time that I, 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 I had an opportunity to, 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 to leave the department uh, for some education. And I, and I went to a uh, course, a three-week course, uh, run by the Police Executive Research Forum, which is a, a, a national uh, police organization. And I was introduced to people who talked about George Kelly, and who talked about disorder, and who talked about what a city needs to survive. And I was able to, to sort of get out of the, 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 the rat race that I was in of locking people up and putting people in jail and, and start to think a little bit about how we could leverage those police officers that are out there on the street in a better way than simply arresting a prosecutor. Now, we'll always have to go to 911 calls. There'll always be terrible things that happen that police need to come in and establish order out of chaos. But there is a lot of time that they have in between calls for service where they can pay attention to those things that might cause crime. Let me give you an example. There was a, uh, there was a bar in Lowell called the Laconia. Um, the Laconia bar was what's referred to in my business as a bucket of blood. Uh, it was a very nasty place full of people who were involved in criminal activity. It was the kind of place where if you needed a gun, you could go there and buy a gun. If you needed heroin, you could go buy heroin. If you needed a hooker or a prostitute, there were prostitutes there. You could get anything you want to at this particular bar. And as police officers, we knew all about this bar because we spent a lot of time in the bar. <laughs> Arresting people. <laughs> Some of us. Every once in a while, we catch people. But we spent, a, we spent a lot of time responding to this place. Uh, it was a nasty, tough place full of, uh, Lowell is known for the Golden Glove. So everybody who was a Golden Glove champion that came out of Lowell, um, you know, that, that did well in boxing, get into the into the uh, into the business. But uh, for every guy that got into the business, there were 20 guys that trained and only fought in the bar. So it was a very interesting place to, 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 be, to be a police officer. But what happened was uh, at the Laconia, as a police officer, I knew that there was good crime occurring around the Laconia. So on Friday night, instead of going up to uh, you know sort of the Belvedere section of the city, which is akin to West Roxbury down here, a nice quiet place, uh, I would go down to Laconia because I knew there was a lot of crime down there. And I'd wait outside and something would happen. 
So we'd be around, all the cops would be driving around, so we'd sometimes we'd sit there with binoculars and look at the front door of the place, and we'd be waiting for a good crime to happen. Because at the time, that's how cops were measured. You were measured on felony arrests, on the number of people you locked up. So we're sitting outside the Laconia watching crime occur with, sun, with, 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 with uh, uh, glasses, and, and then rushing down to catch the person who committed the crime. And then we make a good arrest. One night I was out there, and uh, two guys came out, and they started to fight. So I made my way down, and uh, my brother uh, was in the area cruising. He pulled off just in front of me, and I got out of the car. And uh, these two guys had gotten into a fist fight. One of them picked up a stick and stabbed the other guy with the stick and killed him. So the homicide happened right in front of me. And you know, I, we thought it, it, at the time it was just a minor stab wound. We, they, they, were, they took him off to the hospital. I went down to the hospital and walked in to get information for the report that I was going to write because we have to catalog all these things. And, uh, and I walked into the emergency room and they had cracked this guy's chest and they were trying to close, close the hole up in his, uh, his, his aorta. It was, uh, it was pierced. So he died. And, and, and my brother made an arrest that day and got an award for arresting somebody for homicide. But it made me think that maybe we should be doing something with this bar. Now I know that this sounds pretty basic to everybody here right now as I explain it this way, but the truth of the matter is we weren't encouraged, trained, or even thought that we were responsible for doing anything with the bar other than responding there and making a lot of arrests. That's what they gave us medals for. Nobody got a medal for writing a report to close the bar down. But that's what worked. When we started to think about our business in a different way, we started to not think so much about how many arrests that we had made or how many medals we gave out for gunplay in the city. But we started to think about going to that bar and doing some problem solving. And maybe instead of waiting for a felony to occur, <coughs> violating the bar for excessive service of alcohol, for instance. I mean, when we went into this bar and started to say, you overserve this individual, the bartenders could not understand what we were saying to them. <laughs> That's why they come here. We overserve everyone. <laughs> it was impossible for them to change. So very quickly, because of the violations that they had, we were able to shutter the place. We locked it down. All of a sudden, the crime rate dropped 10% in that neighborhood. That one crime-generating location was responsible for 10% of the violent crime that was occurring in that neighborhood. So it's just common sense that if we pay attention to those things that generate crime, and I'm not talking about, you know, education and poverty and all of the things that the academics talked about. I'm talking about practical, pragmatic issues that are occurring in every city and town in the city. And we take this group of police officers who, who, who are now fairly highly educated and certainly well paid, and we turn them loose. We, 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 we say to them, listen, we're going to turn you loose on this problem, but we want you to use your intelligence and the observations that you have along with regulatory um, enforcement and partnerships that you can build with the community primarily, but also with the, with the, with the myriad of, of agencies at the state and local level that can help you with these problems. Why not have them paying attention to problem solving? Why not have them paying attention to prevention? And, and, and so that's what we did. It was, it was due to George Kelling and the, and the information that he's put out there about uh, the, the role that disorder plays. It was due to a, a, a sort of a new look at the way we do our business and what can be helpful. But it's mostly due to what Bill Bratton says all the time, which is cops matter. Cops really matter. If you recognize their ability and, and the fact that there's a raw material out there that, you know, people are our raw material in our business. The better we educate them, the better we train them, the more responsibility we give them to direct their activities at situations that create a problem, the better off our communities will be. Once that bar closed down, business flourished in that area. 
And as we went bar by bar and drug house by drug house and, and, and employed tactics other than arrest, we had an enormous and immediate effect. Similar to, to what Paul said, the part one crime rate in Lowell dropped 60% in 10 years. It's a 10% reduction in part one crimes. Now it went from 10,000 part one crimes, serious crimes, to 4,000 part one crimes. That's a, that's a remarkable achievement in a city as tough and as, as long term involved in crime and, and drug distribution as Lowell is. I'll tell you one more story that, that, that sort of really illustrates what we do here. I ran this drug unit. And I had about 25 people working for me uh, doing undercover drug operations. And so the way a drug unit works is we, we will uh, target a particular problem, let's say heroin. And we know from working in the drug business that if uh, heroin uh, dealers uh, are the ones that we want to get, the best time to do that is between 6 and 8 o'clock in the morning. That may not seem right to you, but we know that junkies have to have their wake-up call. They have to have their wake-up shot. If they don't get their dope in the morning, they get sick. So, so like breakfast or coffee, people that are addicted to heroin will end up at a particular place to buy dope. And so that means we had to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and be inside the surveillance place at about 5, and we'd sit in the apartment and we'd watch what was going on. And what we would do is we would surveil a drug uh, distribution location and watch the dealers come out and watch them interchange uh, money and drugs with, with, uh, with drug addicts. And then we would follow the drug addicts away from the, from the action. So we didn't want to take the drug addict down right there because all the other drug dealers would run away. So we want to get all of them. So we would uh, have surveillance teams that would jump on uh, one junkie that bought some dope and we'd follow that junkie away to a safe place and we'd stop the car and we'd get the drugs. And then that would give us enough probable cause to arrest the suspect who was dealing the drugs. So we check off the first drug dealer. And, and I mean, there could be a dozen, 20 drug dealers in this particular drug hole that we used to work on all the time. And so we would do this over and over and over again. And, and all of my guys would be dressed up looking like drug dealers. And one night, we did, one day we did this operation. It was a Sunday morning. And it turned out to be Greek Easter, we, we, uh, which is a couple of weeks uh, away from the Easter that I celebrate. But it, I did, the reason I say that is because I didn't realize it was Greek Easter that day, but we scheduled this operation. Obviously, we didn't have any Greeks in our unit. But we, we, we went out and we, and we set up on this thing, and uh, we're, we're, we're trailing the drug dealers around. And then we call in a hit, and we say, okay, we got everybody, we got 10 people, probable cause, take the guy in the white hat and the blue coat, and, the, and, and, and all these 25 officers come racing into the scene, and the drug dealers run down a block, and we chase them, and we jump on them. And, and, and so I walk out, and there's, there's a big monkey pile in the middle of an intersection. And they're all trying to get handcuffs on people, and we're just punching everybody else. It was pretty standard fare for Lowell, and I was like, <laughs> But as I looked up, I saw all these people going to, to Easter Sunday Mass. The Greek, the, the Greek church was right up the street. And they were staring at us, and, and, and they were aghast at this activity that was occurring in the middle of the street. And I realized that unless you really knew what was going on, it looked like there were 35 junkies beating the hell out of you. <laughs> <laughs> like drug dealers. <laughs> so, now I know people, this, I, I did this for 10 years before I figured it out, so my apologies to everybody. <laughs> it took me this long to figure this out. But, but I realized that what was happening was, there was an enormous amount of public money being pumped into a process that seemed to be the right thing to do, but hadn't been thought through. And so what we did was, instead of having 25 undercover officers waiting for a crime to happen and then sneaking up on it to get them in jail, we put two uniformed officers on the same block, and we had them there around the clock. And the two uniformed officers only had to be there to stop the drug deal. They didn't have to arrest anybody. It's the same way we stopped the prostitution in the downtown area. I could arrest, this is, this is the honest to God's truth, in Lowell in 1985, I could arrest 20 hookers and 40 or 50 guys. I wouldn't, the reason we stopped arresting Johns in these drug, op, in these uh, prostitution operations we were doing was simply because we had no space in the cell. And, and, and it wasn't until we realized that if we just put a cop on what the hookers call a stroll, which is the area that they work, 
No one will stop them. And so it's, 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 a, it's a change in philosophy, it's a change in what your business should be, it's a change in looking at what your goals are. We have been involved in, in a decade now of change management in police agencies across the nation, but particularly here in Massachusetts. And there is some great work being done out there with a new attitude of a pragmatic uh, focus on crime prevention and teaming up with our partners to do things that make sense and not just establish an arrest count at the end of the year. And, and, and if you do that, if, if you think differently about our business, it really, it really works much better. Um, Robert, I've taken too much time. No, you're doing well, Commissioner. Thank you. <laughs> just one more thing. The other night, uh, 50 Stanford Street, we receive a call that there's an active shooter in the building. I don't know if, if you know, but there's, a, there's an active shooter situation that has just uh, uh, developed in Fort Hood uh, in Texas, right outside of, uh, uh, of Dallas, Texas. Um, this is, a, this is a, a fact of life for us uh, right now, unfortunately. Uh, we received a call at about uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon to respond to 50 Stanford Street for an active shooter. When we got there, as it turned out, the shooter was uh, someone who had shot a suspect uh, who, had, who had stabbed a doctor uh, dozens of times in the chest. Now, if it wasn't for the, for the individual layer, the doctor would be dead, there's no doubt about it. And, and other doctors would be dead. This, this was a very dangerous situation. But when we got there, we didn't just go in and throw everybody out of the room and do a crime scene. We teamed up with the uh, Mass General Hospital security people. We teamed up with their uh, administration. Uh, we did a joint statement. We worked closely with everybody. Very different <coughs> from what would have happened in the past. I just left a training with all the security directors in the city where we have agreed to do uh, police training for all of the private security people so that they understand what our protocols are and we can learn from them as to what they need from us to make scenes like that safe. And so that partnership, that openness, that transparency that, that we're using in this very tragic situation, I hope is the watchword for our whole business now. And I hope that uh, that you're getting the same type of policing wherever you live uh, that we're providing, we're trying to provide here in Boston. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right, all right. I was taking, you know, I was just sitting here honestly taking a lot of notes. Um,